Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Today we'll have a look at this Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 3. I am happy to say that this is uh, my first donation received for the Artifact channel. It comes from a friend of mine who goes by the handle of Game Creator. He uh, has had this for a few years and uh, he never got it running. He wasn't too enthusiastic about it. And he decided to donate it to the channel so it would finally get fixed. And uh, he doesn't want it back. So, ergo, we have a donation here. The uh, complaint is, is that it turns on but uh, and the disk drives light up, but nothing appears on the screen. This is uh, the deluxe model. It came with uh, two floppy drives, full height floppy drives. Uh, they are single sided, dual density, with a capacity of 180K. And it is also uh, maxed out with RAM, with a whopping 48K of RAM built in. So let's have a look and see what this does. This was released as a follow-up to the Model 1 and uh, it is uh, compatib mostly compatible with it but there are some slight differences forcing uh, publishers uh, to release separate versions for the Model 1 and the Model 3. This one has a Z80 running at 2 MHz and uh, the circuitry is somewhat similar to the uh, Model 1, but a lot of mods made to the mo Model 1 got integrated into this, such as lower case and key repeat and stuff like that. Now in order to get to the inside of this, we have to remove several screws from the bottom and uh, then very carefully lift off the top. And the reason you have to be very careful is it's uh, kind of crowded in there and the uh, monitor neck is sticking out. The monitor is attached to the top part, so when you're pulling this off, uh, parts get left inside and other parts come off, namely the monitor and its control board. So uh, it is not unheard of that if you're not careful when taking off the top, the neck, the monitor neck may get hung up on something and break clean off. And uh, we need to prevent that at all costs. But what I totally forgot was let's turn it on first before taking it apart. Uh, you can see the Variac in the background but I'm not going to use it because this was already turned on very recently before I got it and uh, using the var and uh, whatever damage could have been done to it has already been done so the Variac isn't going to make a big difference. So here it goes. It's very interesting because the power switch on this is very well hidden. Uh, it is under here. I've uh, I'd forgotten that and I plugged it in and I was looking on the back and I couldn't find the power switch but uh, finally I remembered that it is down here. So uh, without further, further ado, let's go. So this is drive zero, drive one. There are no discs in there and I'm not going to put any in there because uh, right now I have I have a few discs but uh, I don't really have an easy way to recreate them and I don't want to destroy them uh, because these drives, uh, this machine has sat for a long time, it's dirty inside and, and uh, I will probably put discs in once we've had a chance to open it up and actually go through and clean the drives. Now this machine is a bit peculiar in that uh, if you start it up like this actually nothing will appear on the screen. If you put a drive in there then uh, uh, I mean a disk in there something is supposed to appear on the screen. You're never supposed to close the drive doors when turning the power switch on because of the way this is built, uh, the head may damage 
whatever track it's sitting over. So you're supposed to turn it on like this. Oh, it was it was already on. Turn it on, and once the drive stops spinning, you're supposed to put a disc in, close the door, and then hit the big orange reset switch over here. Uh, since I don't want to put a, a drive, a disc in there, one other way to get it to display something on the screen is to hold the brake key while resetting it. So if you do that, it supposedly starts up in just non-disc uh, non basic. It basically reverts to a cassette based machine. But you should see something on the screen, for sure. And since it's not showing up, we may have a small or big problem here. The uh, brightness and contrast controls are equally well hidden under this side. And, uh, hello, turning them all the way doesn't yield anything. And I leave them set about midway. And another weird thing is, is notice there's no power switch on, uh, power light on this. So uh, when you're in this state, you never know whether the machine is on or off. I know by memory now that uh, it is on. So uh, now we turned it off. You may have seen the flash in here. But generally, uh, you got to be a bit careful if there's nothing showing on the screen because you don't know whether it's on or off. But then again, it was never intended to run with nothing on the screen. so. I guess that's okay. But uh, let's now go ahead and remove the top. All right, I got the top off without incident after, of course, removing all of the bottom screws and then pulling the top straight up and away from the lower part. The trick here is, is to pull it straight up very slowly and uh, if you feel any sort of undue resistance in there, stop immediately, put it back down, because you probably have the uh, neck board getting hung up on something. But this one came out, nothing broke, and that is cool. So now that we can actually have a look at the neck board, uh, or at the monitor, let's see what, if anything, the monitor does when we turn this thing on. All right, here it goes. Hmm. I'm sure you saw that the neck lit up like a Christmas tree. And uh, now it kind of came back to a quiescent state, but there is a constant glow in it. So, uh, which rules out, of course, uh, that it is getting power, even though we will check... Uh, check all of the power supply voltages, but it's getting power and uh, but I cannot hear the horizontal frequency. And that's not because my ears are going bad, they are going bad, but uh, I can still hear the horizontal frequency on a CRT. And I hear nothing in here, so uh, something in the uh, horizontal section is most likely bad. So let's uh, investigate that further, but uh, first let's look at the uh, power supply voltages. So let's have a look at the voltages. Make uh, sure you ground your meter to something that is actually metal up here. Uh, I was trying to use the bottom of the cabinet as chassis and it took me a while to figure out that the uh, this part of the chassis is made of plastic, so uh, no readings there. But anyway, if we get uh, to this connector over here, we got AC coming in over here, and then we have the uh, power feed to the monitor of these two wires here. And all we want to see here is 12 volts. That's all the monitor gets, and we have that. And then looking on at further voltages, this is, uh, we get the uh, yellow wire, which is minus 12, plus 12, 
and 5 volts. Let's do a quick ripple check on this. This one's good. This one's good. This one's good. And finally, the it has a dedicated 12 volt line going to the monitor. And that one's also good. So uh, let's turn our attention to the monitor then. Here's what the monitor driver board looks like. And uh, we know we're getting heater voltage over here. But uh, we are not getting anything horizontal. So uh, if we look at this briefly, we have ground and uh, 12 volts coming in. Then we have horizontal sync, vertical sync, and video information coming in. I put a scope on the uh, signals themselves. I did not uh, do an in-depth analysis, but uh, I did get traces. There was definitely activity on all three lines. So the motherboard seems to be generating video, but nothing's happening over here. Now that together with uh, the uh, lack of uh, a horizontal, hearing the horizontal frequency, uh, we could go the long way and start tracing signals, the horizontal sync, sync signal coming through here. And uh, But uh, one of the things I'm going to do on this is kind of jump uh, to the head of the queue and make some assumptions here. The uh, One of the most stressed uh, components in here is the horizontal driver transistor because it's got a high voltage on it and it is rapidly oscillating. And uh, let's see, whenever you see a setup like this, uh, usually also in most of the Tektronics manuals you'll see it, when it says do not measure, it's not because your meter can't handle the voltage, but because it is being, because there's a high voltage here that's being chopped rapidly, uh, the, uh, this will probably take care of, of, of a lot of meters uh, just measuring here, and that's why they usually say do not measure, and generally they're not kidding about it either. I wouldn't. What you can measure, of course, is to see the base, uh, you know, what the base voltage is, and uh, what I'm getting at is I'm probably going to just go straight in and remove this transistor and uh, measure it. Because another thing I did was uh, I stuck my finger in, into the chassis and after the system was powered for a while, <clears throat> and I don't recommend you doing this, but I did it anyway, and I touched the transistor and the heatsink, and uh, it was it had not heated up at all. I know a very unscientific way of doing this, but uh, as I said, I'm jumping to the head of the queue. So what I'm going to do is uh, go in there and remove this transistor and test it out a circuit. Now an interesting thing to note is the circuit shows FB501 and FB502, which stands for ferrite beat. But they're actually not, as you'll see, on the PCB. These are actually small beads that go around the legs, uh, the base and the emitter of the transistor. And uh, so they, 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 they are not extra components mounted on the board, but rather just fit over the transistor legs, uh, before you, uh, which you have to put on before installing it. And... Uh, And that's, uh, we need to watch out. We need to put these back. Uh, there's a reason for them being there. It's not just being pretty, but they do dampen the signal, the horizontal signal. They keep the horizontal signal somewhat under control and get rid of any sort of jitters or small jitters that may appear if those beads aren't installed. So here's the board, and you can see somebody had problems with this before because they installed a... Uh, a uh, remote fuse holder there. Now we know that that fuse is good because we saw the neck light up, so no need to test that. So we remove the two screws over here, and 
and uh, again you need to discharge the uh, display tube before doing this let's see if I can even show that to you it's probably really difficult to show the uh, the horizontal transistor in question is it's all the way it's all the way back in here it's on it yeah you can kind of see you can kind of see it over here there's a sticker here on the heatsink that says uh, do not do not touch heatsink and the reason for that isn't so much the heat but uh, the case of that transistor is actually the collector with, uh, which is a part that says uh, do not measure I believe yes so uh, there's two reasons not to touch it one is heat and second of all is the voltage on there so uh, well let's go ahead and remove it I mean I'm not going to take this board out because I have to unplug and unsolder a whole bunch of wires in there I'm just going to uh, the transistor is held in place with two screws I'm going to remove the two screws desolder the uh, connections and pull it out it's the back of the driver board here's where the transistor came out from and uh, I did measure it in circuit first and it looked a bit fishy so it was a good choice to take it out and again note that it's marked FB501, FB502 which are uh, the uh, small beads, ferrite beads that are supposed to go over the uh, legs of the transistor and uh, of course when I took the transistor out they uh, felt they fell on the floor and it took me the last seven minutes to find them again but uh, here's one of them and they shall go back in place now the transistor itself is labeled an A23 I couldn't really find any data on it but it's pretty clear from the schematics that it's essentially a high voltage pretty high frequency uh, MPN transistor so to measure that let us just and we all know how to measure an NPN transistor with a meter right okay so essentially the base is this pin over here and uh, it's an NPN so so that actually goes to the uh, positive lead and uh, we measure against the case which is the uh, collector and should show us and that is what we expect and then we measure against the emitter and it should be similar to that it's a bit low though remember we are measuring the uh, transistor that came out so this one looks suspicious over here and uh, everything else should should be open so now we reverse the leads and we measure collector and that's okay we measure the emitter and that's not okay that is showing us the same voltage in the uh, we saw with the reversed leads and uh, last but not least then we should measure between the emitter and the collector and that's fine and then we swap leads again and we measure emitter collector that is also not right so this thing isn't shorted so that this is not the reason why the fuse was changed or anything 
but uh, there is uh, there is current flowing where there shouldn't be any current flowing. So yes, this thing most likely it's this that's causing the picture not to show up. Now, as I mentioned before, I had a bit of a hard time finding a replacement. An A23 eventually crossed to an NTE part, uh, but then I couldn't find the NTE part. But uh, finally, uh, at the local place, I found a transistor with the uh, same specs as the NTE part, which cost a lot less. And uh, that is an SI2SD577 made by Matsushita. And we can measure this guy to verify what we just saw before. So again, if we go back on the base, base to collector, base to emitter, and look that that number is about twice as high as it was on the other transistor. Now remember, we shouldn't be seeing anything once we change the connection. So this should be open. This should be open. And then finally, this should be open. Because this is just a plain NPN. And this should be open, which it is. So everything is open except uh, when you put the positive lead on the base and measure against the uh, collector and emitter. So this guy definitely has a problem. And as I said before, it's kind of sneaky because normally they short and uh, they get really hot and they blow fuses. But this one obviously didn't do that. It just went bad. So uh, let's put this guy back in and see if my theory was correct. Okay, I got the transistor back in. I only lost one of the beads this time because you got to do it upside down and then uh, because of the wires you can't really see what you're doing and it was pretty interesting but I went in, soldered it back in place and now we're set up to power up the machine again. Uh, a couple of small comments here. The uh, Radio Shack used quite an ingenious retraction device uh, on the uh, on the uh, monitor connector over here, and uh, that ingenious device is over here. It's a rubber band for crying out loud. But when you plug this in here, so when it's in service position, the wire is long enough to allow you to set it up like this and test things. But uh, when you put the case back on top, then uh, the uh, patented retraction device, I guess, kind of pulls the wire back inside so it doesn't get hung up on anything. Uh, well, it's a rubber band, but I gotta say, at least it's a high quality rubber band because it's over 30 years old and it's not falling apart yet. A couple more details here before powering on. I noticed that we are missing a key. It's the uh, it's the right carrot key and it's broken clean off. The contact still seems to work but uh, you're going to have to change your touch typing skills a bit to hit this key properly. But enough talk, let's, we're pl all plugged in, let us have a look at the screen. So here it goes. Now remember, if without disks in the drive, and I'm not going to push any buttons, we may not get a display, but if it's fixed we should see raster. So uh, there you go. There you go, we got raster, so it looks like uh, the transistor fixed it. But let's back up on the uh, brightness. And wait, let's see, I should probably set the contrast too. 
or maybe we should wait till we get something on the screen to set the contrast. So remember, if you hit the break key while resetting it, it should boot into Cassette Basic. So holding down the break key and hitting Reset. And we got Liftoff. So uh, what it is telling us now kind of bright, but it's basically saying cassette, question mark. Mm, not exactly sure what it means, but we got a blinking cursor, so go. Memory size. I don't know. Figure it out yourself. I'm hitting the Enter key. And there you go. It uh, well, the monitor looks like it's fixed. A little bit bright to show. I mean, it looks fine in real life, but uh, the video. So, there you go. It's really, really faint looking at it, but the, cam the camera likes it because if you turn your head left, rotate, rotate your head left, then... Uh, you can actually see what it says on the screen. All right, then, uh, before going on, let's uh, have a look at the disk drives. But first, uh, let's uh, give the monitor a complete bill of health and see what the anode voltage is. And for that, we are going to, from a safe distance, stick in the high voltage probe underneath the anode insulating cup, which you can't really see. But once you've seen one, you've seen them all. And it really does not want to go in there. Oh, getting to arc, and we got in. 11.89 kilovolts. It's supposed to be 12, and uh, that's good because if that is way off, uh, it's going to generate the tube's going to generate a lot of X rays, and the Radio Shack's going to send you a bill for X rays. So uh, no X rays for me tonight, and uh, I think the monitor passes. Here are the drives. So four screws for each and they come out. The edge connector for the uh, for connecting to the uh, controller card and uh, the uh, power connector which has survived to this day on uh, some peripherals. I mean the IBM PC used this and you can still find this in some machines. So uh, theoretically, if you had an old machine, you could plug this into a PC and uh, test it there, I guess. This is made by Texas Peripherals, which I've never even heard of. And uh, it's got the strobe here for testing the uh, rotational speed. So let's do that first. Let's see how our rotation looks like. So watching the strobe, I mean if you squint, you can kind of see the outer ring is supposed to be standing still, but if we get a little bit of help and get it, the light just at the right angle, there you go. You can see that the uh, rotational speed on that one, see, there you go, is okay. So I'll check the other one and then we will open them up. Good thing I didn't put uh, discs in here. So I took the top board off and it turned out that the head was essentially, well, it would only move like two or three tracks in and then get stuck. So it was effectively seized. Now I freed it by hand, but what I need to do is uh, clean the rails that the head assembly slides on 
it's there's no rust or anything on there but it moves kind of rough even even uh, with the uh, stepper motor action so I want to clean these and lube them now normally you should use like a fine white lithium grease or something like that to lube these very little of it so it doesn't spill on any of the rest of the uh, mechanism uh, what I'm going to do though is because I don't have any white lithium grease I'm going to spray some uh, uh, fader lube onto a q-tip and give the rail a light coating then we can also uh, clean the head under here just with alcohol and a q-tip and then give this drive a test okay I uh, clean these rails here first with alcohol and then gave it a very thin layer of uh, fader lube which I sprayed onto a q-tip first and then exercised the uh, track zero switch over here because those tend to get dirty and then the drive will keep trying to retract to track zero and do that forever because the switch never closes properly uh, I also added a little bit of fader lube into the tracks for the uh, disk drive latch because that was squeaking and of course I, uh, I cleaned uh, the single head under here with some isopropyl and a q-tip let's see what happens so a few days have passed uh, I got some other had some other things to do and of course I figured out that I needed to make some discs for this because I didn't have any and of course that involves uh, getting a lot of software disk images and it's got to run on an old PC with a 360 K five and a quarter inch drive and but uh, the details of that will leave for another video uh, the main problem was that I was able to cobble together a machine to do this, but I didn't have a 360k drive. I used a 1.2 meg drive with twice the tracks, and uh, it was uh, the results were so-so. But uh, let's have a look and see where we got. So the first disc that I'd forgotten I had was this disc that was sitting on the top drive when I got the machine. It was really really dusty on top uh, and uh, I somewhat cleaned it off but I think the saving grace is that this disc protected the top drive all that dust that got on here you know missed the interior of the drive and also on a single-sided disc the bottom is what is utilized so uh, there's actually a chance that this disc may still be good. So this is probably a great place to start a test. So we'll put that in and it's asking us for a diskette. We close the drive. And so there you go, it actually loaded TRS-DOS. Can we run a directory? Alright, so uh, it looks like that drive is somewhat working. Let's put things back together and do some more interesting tests. Well, let's just assume that this thing is brand new, just came out of the box, and uh, I've actually read the manual, or at least glanced at it, and what it tells you is the first thing you need to do is take your TRS-DOS version 1.3 and back it up. So here's one of the discs I made, one of the few that is actually proven to be reliable, and a blank disc for the backup. Okay, you're supposed to leave the latches open because otherwise uh, the head may, uh, 
the head may do may do damage to the discs when it ac asking you for a disc. Close the latch or latches. And uh, there we are. So uh, we will use the built-in utility called backup. We'll copy from zero to one. Master password. Oh, let's hope nobody changed that. This kit contains data. Use disk or not. Yes. Use it. Do you wish to reformat? Yes. So this is kind of like uh, watching your your laundry dry, but uh, we need to see this do at least something useful before we sign off. Talk about uh, let's talk about some uh, of the open issues while uh, we're having fun watching this do something. Uh, the open issues really are that this key over here you can't really see right now, but I showed you before. The keycap and the stock are broken off the switch. It's the uh, right carrot key. And uh, I'm going to have to find a replacement for it. Uh, replacing the key itself is not a huge deal. I'll have to disassemble the keyboard. I have to do that anyway. Because some of the keys, even though all of the keys work, some of them need to be pressed uh, uh, with a little bit extra force to react. And it's got these stupid help labels on here which I'm gonna have to pull all the keys off get those off and clean up the keyboard nicely and uh, but other than that uh, the machine seems to be done once I get myself the proper five and a quarter inch drive for the DOS machine then I can start making some uh, some more discs some more images and uh, have some more fun with this machine And let's see what else. Oh, I did. I, I do have another image that I'm going to show you after this. Hopefully, uh, concludes doing what it's doing successfully. And this is kind of interesting. Okay, so it did an intelligent backup. It didn't just go ahead and read the whole disk, but actually uh, went through the file allocation table and only read sectors that were in use. So that seemed to have worked. And let's see if we can get a directory of the newly formatted disk. We can. Now this, of course, this, of course, begs to have us run the memory test. Okay. This shouldn't take too long. Our ROM checksums are good. And uh, now it's actually testing. Doing a pretty quick test. I don't think it's doing any checkerboard patterns or anything like that. It's probably simply reading and writing to each location one or two values zero and an FF and uh, if that passes they call it good so pass the memory test and now they're going through uh, screen memory probably reading writing it and I mean writing to it and reading it back and making sure that everything uh, is what it should be and uh, we should be done in a second. And we are. Checks out. And finally to something that I consider I must have for a machine of this age. Well, for any machine, but especially for a machine of this age.
I haven't played this in a really long time. But I'll probably sit down and try to play it. Again, I actually have Zork 1, 2, and 3, all three of them working. And uh, when I feel when I feel especially bored, I will probably sit down and play through all three of them again. Thanks for watching. Hope you like this and uh, I've inspired you to not throw away that old computer and if you see one on the side of the road not to let it sit there but pick it up. A lot of the stuff is eminently fixable and uh, there's no reason to throw these away. Everybody should have one in these. Everybody should have at least one of these in their homes. Uh, leave me a comment, uh, especially if you have any idea where I can uh, get a replacement or a parts donor keyboard for this thing. Leave me a thumbs up if you think uh, I did a good job and uh, subscribe if you haven't already done so. We'll see you later.